today we start the book of Romans. Exciting. <laughs> well, I can say this isn't my fault. I'm divorced everyone who's been through this book. So, um, no, I'm just kidding. I am, you have no idea how excited I am about this. And uh, the way I project it out, you know, we will take uh, Advent off as we normally do. But uh, I'm guessing it's going to take us about a year um, to get to Romans. And um, so it's going to be a good time. And, and you know me, we don't, I don't want to dodge the hard passages. And uh, I, I've told you a couple people have said, um, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that to yourself? Because <laughs> Romans is such a difficult book. And, um, and like I said, my response to them was, I don't buy it. Like I said, my DS was like, "Man, just keep going, keep going, and going until you read it." And um, and then some people said, "Man, you should just skip chapter one." <laughs> that seems to be where all the hard parts are. Um, I said, "Nope, we're going every verse, uh, every passage. We're just going to walk through it, and we'll figure it out as we go along." And Romans is such an important book um, in so many different ways. In fact, here's a couple quotes: uh, a guy named Martin Luther. You may have heard of him. Uh, Reformation is coming up. He says this. Um, he says it's really the chief part of the New Testament and the purest gospel. And then he said on the screen, it is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word, by heart, so get busy, you got a year, um, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of, ter- of the church. And I was like, what? That's what he said about Romans. Um, and then our brother from another mother, John Calvin, said this. Um, which is... Um, says, if we have gained a true understanding of this epistle, we have an open door to all the most profound treasures of Scripture. William Tyndall, great translator of the Bible, uh, English translator, says this, uh, the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament, talking about Romans, and the most pure uh, egalion, which is a Greek word meaning meaning, um, gospel or good news, that is to say glad tidings, and also a light and a way into the whole Scripture. He went on to urge us readers like me to always look at that. And then uh, our brother from the same mother, John Wesley, um, said this. Uh, he was in a, a, a class meeting and uh, on May 24th, 1738, and uh, he had just returned from Georgia, great state, and um, had ministered to Native, as he was ministering to Native Americans. And while listening, this is so bizarre, while listening to a reading of Luther's preface, Romans. So somebody who's reading Luther is like not even Romans, just the preface to it. He says this about a quarter before nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did not, I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that had taken away my sin, even now, and saved me from the law of sin. That's what he's people are talking about because this book that we're getting ready to go through. And that's why people are afraid of it, I think, because it is such a big deal. And um, and, it, and it talks a lot about uh, it talks a lot about a lot of stuff. And uh, we'll get into that as we come through it. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to start at Romans chapter 1. And um, seven verses today. If you don't have a Bible, there's a pew Bible in front of you, and page numbers will be on the screen. So a lot of background today. A lot of... Um, Bible quizzing days. He's getting ready to jump up really fast. And um, so a lot of background. I'm going to try not to bore you today. Some of you will find this fascinating and others may not, but I think it's going to be really fun. So now let's stand, if you don't mind, as we read God's word together. <coughs> Honor the reading of God's word. I will start reading verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to faith and obedience for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God, and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Amen. Next slide. This is the word of God for the people of God. And you said, thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Let's pray. 
God be uh, starting a journey today, and um, man, it's going to take us all sorts of places, hard, difficult, fun, and exciting, um, but Lord, once again, we believe this is inspired from you, that, that it, it leads us, it tells us more about what it means to be saved and what that looks like, and so help us, God, as we begin this journey, um, we, we just... short today, God, but with your wise and eloquent words, but I think they showed us the truth in your spirit. Help us know better and know better. And so, Father, my prayer for you is that the words that come out of my own mouth this morning would help us to be pleasing and acceptable to you and God. In Jesus' name, amen. So why did Paul write the letter uh, to Romans? Why did Paul write the letter? First off, okay, what we have to understand is it's a letter, okay? It's a letter to a church in Rome. Now, some people say it's a systematic theology or it's this, 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 and this. It's a letter. Like I would write a letter to the church in pain or something. Like I write a letter. And so we have to understand, and, and, and why that's important is it wasn't written in a vacuum. It wasn't like Paul was somehow taken out of the world to write Romans and then injected back into it. It was written to a specific group of people at a specific time in history. Oh, this is so exciting, Pastor Jamie. I'm so thrilled. Um, and so what we have to understand is what was happening in that time. Why would Paul write this? He didn't write it for us in the year 2016, although we can gain a lot of insight from it. He wrote it to Romans way back when, uh, the Roman church. And so to understand what was kind of happening and, and so we can grapple with really what the text is trying to say, um, we're going to just talk a little bit about what was going on. Uh, so, uh, now we're not sure how Christianity reached Rome for sure, but it's most often believed that, that on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, it talks about how some were there from Rome. And that when Peter busted out of the open room, upper room and, and preached this gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, once they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, that there were some there from Rome who then went back and, um, and, and, and started a church. So uh, that happened, uh, what scholars believe, is um, around A.D., oh, that's B, sorry, A.D., um, like 30 slash 31, all right, is when they kind of think Pentecost happened. And so that's when the church somehow formally, they think it began in the, in, in the, the city of Rome as well and what that looks like. Now, around A.D. 49, jump ahead a little while. Uh, there was this emperor named Claudius, okay? And Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Kicked them all out because they kept rioting about a person and named in history. If you looked at the history books, the, the name of the person is uh, spelled like this, Crestus, which sounds a lot like Christ. So they were making a ruckus about this person called Jesus, and the Roman emperor kicked them all out. All the Jews, you gotta leave, you gotta leave. Which is pretty cool. Um, and, and part of that Roman, that Jewish, um, they got kicked out, were these two ladies named, um, you may have heard of them before, Priscilla and Aquila. You may have heard of them in Corinthians. Paul talks about Priscilla and Aquila, which, I mean, your baby's being born, ladies. You know what I'm saying? Like, that is some good names right there. Priscilla and Aquila uh, from Corinthians. Paul talks about them. And the ladies, uh, they were from Rome. They had been displaced, went to Corinth, where they happened to meet this guy named Paul. And then they, uh, and, and then what happens is in AD, isn't this awesome? 54, Claudius dies. Bah, bah, bah. You know what I'm saying? The Roman emperor dies. And the edict is lived so that the Jews can then go back to Rome. Woo! Um, now, if, if you are good at math, which I'm not, this is about six years, right, that the Jews were out of Rome, and then they're allowed to come back. And In fact, it's believed that, that part of the time that Paul was in Corinth was during the six years, and that Priscilla and Aquila delivered the Roman letter from Paul to the church at Rome. This is so exciting to me. I, and we'll get there. We'll get to the Bible. I promise. We'll get there. So three months. He, and, 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 and so what's happened is Paul is in Corinth. 
if you read the book of Corinthians, he's collected an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And so what Paul wants to do is he wants to go back to Jerusalem to give them the money that he had gotten. He wants to then go to Spain, and he wants he believes that God has called him to go to Spain to minister to those Gentile people uh, the gospel of the good news because nobody's been there yet. Well, Rome happens to be in the middle between Jerusalem and Spain, and so he's writing to the church because he wants to stop in Rome. Now, this is a big deal because every other letter that Paul has written, he has either started the church or he's been a significant part of that church. He's never been to Rome before. So he writes this letter. Never been there. Why is that interesting? Well, some people say that what Paul was saying, and, and, and he talks to the Romans here in a little bit, and, and we'll get to it later. Um, he asked them for money that they might fund his trip to Spain. And so some people think, oh, this is kind of funny, they think this is a fundraising letter that he's right in Rome because he needs some funds to get to Spain. And so they think that Paul was kind of trying to conjure up some support, and so he wrote Romans to send to them. Okay, I, I don't know if that's specifically necessarily true, but it, it might be. So because of this, it's believed that Paul wrote this letter um, around since Priscilla and Aquila's Senate, uh, like 56 slash 57 A.D., and what that looks like. And uh, once again, that our, our lady here, friends here, Priscilla and Aquila, delivered after they went back, after the edict was lifted in 54 AD. Um, so why the letter? Why the letter? Um, why the letter? It's a good question. I think maybe um, Paul had heard rumors about things that were happening in the Roman church, uh, things that, that weren't necessarily potentially who God had called them to be. Um, maybe the Roman church had, had heard rumors about Paul, and how he persecuted Christians at some point. Um, and so Paul, wanting them to raise funds, is saying, hey, I'm not that dude anymore, right? Or, or maybe they've heard other rumors about things that he's done, and so he's trying to, to, to share a little bit about who he is, what he believes the gospel is, and what if we really unite around is who Jesus has called us to be. I think another reason he wrote the letter to the church is because of this right here, this six-year period. I think this is important in the book of Romans. And here's why. Have you ever worked somewhere um, or lived somewhere, and then for whatever reason you didn't work there or live there anymore, or you changed jobs, or you were gone for some time, and then for some reason, whatever you were allowed, you went back to that place or that, that you lived, um, or you, you visited a place. Have you ever been to a place? Um, every time I go back home to my Georgia, to my church, to my family in Georgia, it's not my Georgia, but um, every time I go back to Georgia, uh, New stuff starts popping up. And one of the first questions I ask my mom as I'm driving down the road to get to my house when I get there is like, when did that get there? When did that pop up? Why did they tear down the old Hardys and build a new Hardy? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what was that all about? Um, you know what I'm talking about? You go somewhere after you've been absent for some time, and it's different. Well, the Jewish people were gone for six years. Now, what you have to understand is, is when they went back to Rome, uh, the Romans, the Gentiles, were running the church while the Jews were gone. And, and Christianity, when it was first birthed in, in, in the Pentecost, was a Jewish faith. It was Jewish. And so what had happened is, is they, they kept uh, living into their Jewish um, rituals and traditions just with the thought that Jesus was the Messiah rather than uh, that, that had come to save them. But they still kept their Jewish festivals and traditions. Well, you take the Jews out... And now it's just Gentiles running the place. What may have slipped a little bit? Some of their customs, some of their thoughts about what Christianity should be. The Jews come back and they are mad. You're not doing this the right way. We were just gone for six years. Couldn't you just keep this going? And so things all of a sudden became a, that, 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 that when the Jews were there and then they left, the Romans kind of got around and said, you know what this circumcision thing? Maybe it's not as big as we thought. We might could get a lot more people to join our church. If we didn't make them become circumcised as a prerequisite to joining our church. I mean, that whole, like, um, bacon thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, bacon smells good. It tastes good. Like, Surely God can't be against bacon. You know what I mean? Like, like 
really? Like if I have a little bacon, like God's going to somehow. And so there's this thing started happening, right? That, that, that when the Jews came back, they're like, what's going on? This isn't what Christianity is. This isn't what it means to be the people of God. And so there became some disputes among the returning Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians that had been there before. So maybe Paul is trying to speak into that. In fact, some people say the book of Romans doesn't actually start until chapter 9. When Paul starts talking about all these disputes, but he has to lay the groundwork from chapters 1 to 8 so that he could then talk about the disputes in chapters 9 to 16. That, that, that what 1 to 8 is, is this preview, this understanding of what we are to center our lives around and what that looks like so that he could then address the issue of what it means to be a Jewish Christian and what it means to be a Gentile Christian and what really should unite us rather than what you have me in. Is this interesting, fascinating? Like, hopefully what's happening now is if you've read the book of Romans, certain passages are starting to explode in your head. And we'll get there, I promise, we'll get there. It's starting to explode to the day we embark on this journey. Talking about dressing, Paul is addressing, people come back, and he hears some rumors about things that are happening when these Jews have come back. And he's trying to get them to understand what the gospel of Jesus Christ really is what really is important and what are things that, that we might think are important because we like them but maybe they're not as essential as we think they are. Oh man, doesn't this sound appropriate? Isn't this appropriate maybe for where we find ourselves currently? Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I'm excited. I am so pumped. All right, so let's jump in. Verse one. Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, this word servant in the Greek has this understanding of it was used for a relationship of a slave and a master, a relationship of, of somebody who was in charge and somebody who did what the, the, the master wanted to do. But it's not this negative understanding of what a slave was. It is actually this understanding that I am totally committed to doing whatever my master tells me it, 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 it's more of a submission than it is a forceful understanding. And so Paul is saying, I am a slave to Jesus, to Christ Jesus, and, and I'm, I'm a slave to his purposes and his plans, but it has nothing to do with Jesus being this overbearing slave master and has everything to do with I have chosen to do whatever he has called me to do. I have chosen to totally submit my life to him and call him my master and Lord. Not because I feel like if I don't that I'm going to get struck with lightning or a piano is going to drop on my head. It is my choice to follow Jesus with everything that I am. We're going to get into more. Paul tells this story in just a few chapters. It's amazing. So awesome. So it's this understanding of total submission. And so I'm a servant to, of Christ Jesus. Now we usually flip that. And when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about Jesus Christ and, and his life. But this is actually a better understanding because Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. It is not like we renamed Jesus after he was crucified, dead, and buried, and raising him from the dead. Christ is a title, kind of like a, we call people doctor or medical doctor, or you have a PhD, or you know the, the popular degree at, at my school that I went to was the MRS degree. You know what I'm saying? It's the missus. No, I'm getting married. Anyway, okay. Um, it's a title about who Jesus is. So, uh, it, 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 it is huge. So what it's actually saying is we believe that Jesus, who was dead, came down to life, incarnate, that we sang about earlier, babe in a manger. We believe that he is the Messiah, the one sent from God. We believe that he is the one who has come to redeem all of creation. And so when we say the word uh, Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, what we're in essence saying is we're, we are saying political talk, that we believe he's the king, that we believe he's the one that has come to bring about redemption and not anybody else. And then Paul says he's set apart. Now the set apart is um, this understanding of, it's not that, that Paul is necessary um, outside of, but rather it's what he's set apart to do. It's not what he's set apart from, it's what he's set apart for. That he can be who God has called him to be, and it goes back to this total understanding of what the slave was and what this looks like. Let's go to verse 2. The gospel, uh, set apart for the gospel of God, uh, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures. Oh 
man, you're like, we are never going to get through this book if you're going this slow. I promise you, I promise you. Um, this, I am so pumped about this verse. <laughs> so excited about this verse. Why? Because this is what it says. You ready? This book of Romans that sometimes we separate as this, 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 this understanding that is different. It's no, it, what it is, is it's a continuation of the stories that the prophets told before Jesus. It's a continuation of the story of Jesus Christ. It's a continuation of the story of God freeing his people from slavery in Egypt. And so what Romans is and how we have to structure it and understand it is it's not this separate book that can be taken apart from the rest of what the scripture is talking about. In fact, it doesn't make sense apart from the Old Testament and all the things that God has done in the life of his people. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, this book, this book, this letter that I am writing you, all I'm doing is talking about the story of the people of God from the very beginning of history. Oh, I think that's huge. Donald Trump. It's a big deal. Because if we take it apart and it's this separate thing out of the context and out of the understanding, then it becomes its own separate thing. But if it's part of the story of the people of God, then guess what? It makes it, it it's, it's hugely important about what has happened before through all the prophets and, and the understanding of that. And it's hugely important about it speaks about the end as well. That it's not this subtracted understanding, but it's just Paul saying, I'm just telling the same story that Isaiah and Jeremiah something that's just by happen chance like it makes sense and understand it's Jesus looking at the people and says I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets but I've come so that they might be fulfilled in Jesus so Romans is uh, this isn't on the screen but there's really one guy I was reading this week I really like his last name is uh, Mu I don't know I know it Douglas J. Mu he says this Romans is ultimately a book about God how he acted to bring salvation how his justice is preserved, how his purposes are worked out in history, and how he can be served by his people. I think that is awesome. So as I've been studying, and people I think are so scared of this book, when you understand it, how it fits in the bigger picture and what Paul is trying to do, man, it's like, yes, of course. This makes so much more sense to me. My, my mind has just been like, You'll get there, I promise. You'll get there. We're going to get there. All right, let's keep, keep going. Verse 3. Regarding his son, this part of the story, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now he says a descendant of David, and this is huge, because if he was just talking to his Jewish audience that went back, then he probably would have used Abraham. He was a descendant of Abraham. But he's not just talking to this Jewish audience. He's also talking to his Gentile audience and saying this understanding that, that, that he's descendant of David, which was the kingly understanding. And so in the midst of this Roman understanding where Caesar is Lord and, 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 and he's the one that's going to bring peace and he was the one, he's the son of God. He was the one who was Lord. He's saying, no, 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 no. This is the one who was descended from David. This is actually the one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the one whom we pledge allegiance. So it's so such a big deal. It's such a big deal. He says, you know what? This, 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 this story is about the one who is descended from David. He uses this phrase, spirit of holiness, which is, as some people said, actually what is translated is that the Holy Spirit is the one who allows this story to be lived again and again. And he calls him son of God, which once again was Caesar's name. So this, this first little bit, Paul is saying, Roman government is saying one story, we need to do it ourselves. And he says by his resurrection from the dead. I love it, by his resurrection from the dead. Uh, this is the beginning. The resurrection is the beginning of new life, a new era, a new story. Death no longer is the end, but we can now be risen with who Jesus Christ has called us to be. Verse 5. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to faith and obedience for his name. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to the bond of Jesus. I'm going to camp here for just a little bit. It says to faith and 
no defense. Um, spoiler alert. In chapter 16, Paul also says, this whole thing is about his knees. He begins the letter talking about being called to obedience, and he ends the letter when he's talking about being called to obedience. This is going to help with your memory. This isn't just something that Paul said, this isn't just something that our mind tries to figure out, but it actually calls us to live a certain way. And as Wesleyans, we should be like, woo! This isn't something that, that I just wrap my mind around and can figure out intellectually, but it actually has a heart transformation understanding that God is calling me to live and breathe and to act differently. We don't just say, man, I understand Jesus now. The way we understand who Jesus is is we live something different in every arena of our lives. The call to follow Jesus is the call to obedience. Um, we, we, we've talked about it before, but that's the way the whole Israel nation begins is this understanding of the Shema. And the Hebrew word Shema means hear, but it's not just hear. It's, this, it's in hearing you live and you talk. No longer come to my house and see how I really talk to my wife. But um, they're out and they're going places they shouldn't go. I clap my hands. And it usually gets their attention. And then if they don't turn and look at me, I clap a little harder, maybe talk a little bit louder. And then if they still don't do it, then I start to go after them with whatever I can find to get attention. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just that type of deal. But the way I know they heard me is they turn and they listen and they do what I say. I think the same can be said for Jesus. The way he knows we've heard him is not that just we hear with our ears, but we hear with our lives. The way he, we, he understands that we are understanding what he's calling us to is not just I get it intellectually, but I get it because it's a life to be lived with every ounce of who we are. It's going to help you remember. Paul, uh, on the Damascus Road, as Jesus called him in the shining about that later, he could have said, hey, I hear you with my ears, but I'm still just going to go and kill Christians. He responded with his life in such a way that he lived for God with everything he had. Verse 17. For all in Rome, who are loved by God, are called to be his holy people, grace all in Rome. Not just the Jewish Christians, not just the Gentile Christians, not just the Nazarenes or the Baptists or the Methodists or the Lutherans. Or to all. The Greek word there means all Christians who are following after Jesus. Grace and peace. Um, I think it's been a month ago I got to be a writer in Japan. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, we were there, and <laughs> you may not think this is funny, but I thought it was quite hysterical. And so we'd done the rehearsal, and um, we were giving gifts to the bride, uh, to the groomsmen and the bridesmaids. And we're getting ready to leave, and I'm going to my motel, and Matt and Robin, we're getting ready to leave. And, and Matt and Robin, I don't know if you remember this, he's, he's walking around, and he keeps going, peace be with you, peace be with you. Just keep saying it to everybody. And Robin looks at him and says, you can't say that. I'm not the pastor. And I was like, I didn't realize I had this, I'm the only one that can say peace be with you or whatever. And he just kept walking around saying peace be with you, peace be with you. And on the inside I was just like, yes. Yes. That's it. Peace be with you. Now I think that he actually was saying it on, on purpose and then it kind of got to be this funny thing and <laughs> Robin was like, don't say that. And I'm like, no, say it more. We need to say that more to each other. We need to say that more to people we come in contact with who aren't following after Jesus. You know in the, the Episcopal Church, I always say the Episcopal, probably the, the Roman Catholic too, but the Episcopal Church, they actually have a moment in their service where they walk around and they actually say grace and peace to you. It's one of my favorite parts of going to, to one of their churches. 
funerals, the whole thing. Anytime they're together, they, pa- they, they call it passing the peace, and they literally say, grace and peace be with you. And then you're supposed to respond, and also with me. I think that's awesome. Why? Because I think what they're saying is, I want God's saving and sustaining grace to be a part of your every day. I want God's peace, or in in Hebrew talk, his shalom, which means wholeness, completeness. I no longer want you to be a divided person. I want you to be whole and complete. And I believe that the way that we are whole and complete is if God's peace rests on your life. You know, in, uh, in the synagogue, this isn't even my notes, so this is free this week, all right? Uh, in, my, in, my, in, in the synagogue, when they would pronounce the blessing, that they literally believed that God's words were resting on each individual, the blessing. And they were so afraid that, 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 that something might happen is that when the priest or the, the rabbi would pronounce the blessing, they would cover their face. God, don't, don't hurt me. Such a big deal. And when we walk around, and, 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 and I, I want you to know, every Wednesday night we pray for this time that we get to spend together. And my prayer is, God, if you can use a, a handshake, a holy high five, a hug, to make a difference in somebody's life, let that be what it is. What if we understand the power of wishing grace and peace in each other's lives? And so Matt's walking around the rehearsal dinner, he's like, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. And Robin's like, Shut probably wouldn't say that, but uh, and, and I'm like, no, please say that more, God, more, more, not just to those who are here, we should want grace and peace for all of your life. So when we say grace and peace be with you, it's like I want God's gracious, sustaining, powerful grace to be such a part of your life that you can never understand what is going on. It's shalom. It's not based on circumstances. Circumstances may go south in a hurry, but God's peace and my identity and his wholeness can still be a part of my life. I want to pass that on. Isn't that the point of what this whole life is about? Having God's grace transform us and his peace so lived in us each and every day that our identity is wrapped up in That's what we want for ourselves, for all people. So what about in your life? Do you need more of God's grace in your life? Do you need more of God's peace in your life? Is life chaotic? Um, Yesterday we were at a cross country meet and we had a storm that came through and we were outside. Walking and we had some elementary kids. We did elementary fun run and we were tearing up the charger van for them going. I can't do that because I'm three right now. But um, we got them to the bus, and of course, my car was parked all the way on the other side of campus. I had this umbrella, and I would drive from like here to here because the rain was coming. It's like Forrest Gump rain. You know what I'm saying? And it was rolling sideways and coming up from the ground and everything else. And I was just drenched. I was walking at one point and the wind caught my umbrella and like spun it around and and I'm trying to hold like my coffee, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't spill that in the middle of the rain. I'm trying to hold my coffee and I got a backpack on and I'm like fighting this umbrella just trying to get to my car. Maybe life is like that for some of us right now. You're just trying to hold your umbrella without spilling the coffee. And you need God's Thank you.